This is Catonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello, this is Breach Burke. Before we get into this week's podcast, I would like to thank my patrons personally. Gwyn K, Politi, Caitlin N, John H, Tanya T, Veronica S, Gabby, Helen M, Ruth S, Sunny H, Scott K, J.R.M., Susie G, Eldritch Priest, B. Lupita, C. Roberts, Jeanette, and D.S. I really appreciate those of you who have joined recently and who have stuck with me over these years. Our community is small, and there's so much I would like to do in terms of providing courses, conversation on the dark feminine, and extra content, so please consider joining at patreon.com slash Catonia. Now on to the podcast. Hello and welcome to Catonia, the podcast that deals with the dark feminine. I'm Breege Burke, and we are in the winter time of the year. Well, we're not quite at winter. I'm actually recording this on the 8th of December. But we are moving closer to the winter solstice. Uh, The winter solstice is traditionally thought of as being December 21st. Uh, There are some slight variations in date, which we are going to talk about as part of today's topic. But because we're going into winter and dealing with winter subjects, uh, I've been trying to do podcasts on figures that are relevant to this period of time. Now, there's a lot of them that I have done in the past, uh, particularly from European folklore, uh, Germanic folklore, Scandinavian folklore. And this is actually another example from Scandinavian folklore. And this is the has to do with a figure known as Lucy, okay? and it's spelled L-U-S-S-I. Now, Lucy is connected, as you might imagine, or as you may have potentially have guessed, to Santa Lucia or St. Lucy. Now, uh, Santa Lucia's day is December 13th. So from when I'm recording this, actually by the time this podcast comes out, uh, I think it will be the following Wednesday is technically Santa Lucia's day. And like like a lot of these uh, the feast days or these these special special rituals or special ceremonies or customs that may be connected with certain saints, a lot of times they had another origin or another origin story. And this is no exception because Lucy, which means light, has to do, it's it's connected to uh, the word, uh, Latin word lux, which has to do with light. And we see Lucy in other places too, like Lucifer, for example, uh, who is actually means light bringer. And quite similarly, we have this idea of somebody who is a light bringer as having some kind of a dark or negative connotation. Now, uh, St. Lucy, uh, or St. Santa Lucia, I want to talk a little bit about her first, because that is that is the, the modern celebration. Those are the modern uh, rituals or the modern ceremonies or festivals that still take place in Scandinavia to this day around uh, Santa Lucia and around December 13th. I'm going to talk a little bit about that first and the, the sort of Christian martyr association. And then I want to look at Lucy herself, the, the Lucy that, was, that, that predates Santa Lucia, who is actually considered to be a sorceress. And as you will see, she has many characteristics in common with a number of other dark feminine figures connected with winter in Northern Europe. And also she is connected with this phenomenon that is known as the wild hunt. Uh, we Largely we hear about the British version of the wild hunt. Uh, however, in Germanic folklore, it's generally Wotan or Odin, who is the head of the wild hunt. Um, but as we will see, there are some female figures, uh, Lucy included, who is also the head of the wild hunt up on uh, on. This, this solstice day, December 13th. Uh, and as part of that, I'm going to talk about why it's December 13th and not December 21st that we are talking about with regard to solstice. And also the connection of this, like a lot of these other wintertime figures, you know, there was uh, also Sinterklaas or Santa Claus who is connected as well. And so we see the connections of these different saints, St. Nicholas, St. Lucy, and so forth with this season. Uh, but there are some... Original, original figures, or, or at least certainly the, the traditions we have now, 
uh, definitely come out of this this earlier place. So we can connect Santa Claus to the to the Wild Hunt to some degree. And Lucy, this uh, we can also connect to uh, Santa Lucia, even though their stories are quite different. There is there, there is an element of, of th- you know there there's combining of these two elements in in one, which again is not it's not unusual. Just as it's not as un- unusual for a church to be built on top of a holy well, or a name of a saint to come from an earlier. A pagan deity or demonic spirit that may have originally inhabited the place. Now it becomes a saint, right? Because Santa Lucia herself is is actually a Roman martyr. She's she's a martyr from the Diocletian period of of persecutions against Christians, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But it's really interesting because we have a lot of themes to look at here with regard to the not only to to Lucy and what she represents and other figures like her but also where the wild hunt fits in and also has a lot to do with the treatment of animals as well uh, so let's let's dive into this uh, this dark feminine figure uh, called Lucy and we'll start by talking about Santa Lucia or Saint Lucy so I'm gonna read a little bit and I'm literally just doing the Wikipedia thing here just because I'm kind of giving a jumping off introduction here uh, I do have a number of other sources that I'm consulting for this, but just to give a kind of a broad overview of Saint, what they're calling St. Lucy's Day. And it says, uh, St. Lucy's Day, also called the Feast of St. Lucy, is a Christian feast day observed on 13th December. The observance commemorates Lucia of Syracuse, an early 4th century virgin martyr under the Diocletianic persecution. According to legend, she brought food and aid to Christians hiding in the Roman catacombs, wearing a candlelit wreath on her head to light her way, leaving both hands free to carry as much food as possible. Because her name means light, and her feast day had at one time coincided with the shortest day of the year prior to calendar reforms. It is now widely celebrated as a festival of light. Falling within the Advent season, which of course are the roughly four weeks before Christmas, uh, the St. Saint- Lucy's Day is viewed as a precursor of Christmas tide pointing to the arrival of the light of Christ in the calendar on December 25th, Christmas Day. St. Lucy's Day is celebrated most widely in Scandinavia, Italy, and the island nation of St. Lucia, each emphasizing a different aspect of her story. In Scandinavia, where Lucy is called Santa or Santa Lucia, she is represented as a lady in a white dress symbolizing a baptismal robe and a red sash symbolizing the blood of martyrdom with a crown or wreath of candles on her head. And in some, I believe, she also carries a palm branch to represent martyrdom as well. Uh, It says, in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Swedish-speaking regions of Finland, as songs are sung, girls dressed as St. Lucy carry cookies and saffron buns in procession, which symbolizes bringing the light of Christ into the world's darkness. In both Catholic and Protestant churches, boys participate in the procession as well, playing different roles associated with Christmas tides, such as that of St. Stephen, or generic gingerbread men, Santa Clauses, or Nisses. The celebration of St. Lucy's Day is said to help one live the winter's days with enough light. Okay, that's really the key thing that we are looking at here. Now they're saying, you know, there, there is some talk about the origins of St. Lucy's Day here and, and how it how it developed. I don't think that's really as fundamentally important here, but I think this idea of this, the, and usually it's a procession of younger girls uh, on Santa Lucia Day, from what I recall, because, you know, we had had some, when I was younger, I remember... Uh, I remember seeing a Santa Lucia procession that was actually done in the States. And I'm trying to even remember if I was part of it. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, I was like, was I that? Do I remember it because I was part of it? Possibly. Um, but it was a long, you know, very long time ago. I want to say it was around 1979 or you know, in that neighborhood. And at, and at the time, I think actually we were doing it in a public school at the time. So I don't think there was meant to be any kind of connection to uh, to the religious aspect of it, just simply that it was a, a Christmas tradition from another uh, another place. Now, they mention here about the 13th of December. And, of course, this was the winter solstice according to the Julian calendar, which would have been in place at the time that this started to be um, celebrated. It says the, this discrepancy of eight days would have been the case in the Julian calendar during the calendar during the 14th century, residing, resulting in winter solstice falling on 13th December. 
With the original adoption of the Gregorian calendar in the 16th century, the discrepancy was 10 days and it increased to 11 days in the 18th century when Scandinavia adopted the new calendar with the winter solstice falling on the 9th of December. Uh, so they were talking a bit about that. So yeah, there's there's some calendaring adjustments that go on here. But even though the way the new calendar, or the Gregorian calendar, which is the one we still follow, uh, ended, adjust, ended up adjusting the day to the 21st, which is the way that we, we see it, uh, the, this particular holiday is still celebrated on the 13th. And basically, regardless of which date it falls on, it is definitely uh, considered to be the longest night of the year. And that's really what what's important here. We'll even find if you look at, at calendaring here in the West, I mean, we, we show the, the solstice is happening on a particular date. But when it actually comes to the amount of daylight, you know, you, there may be some discrepancy between, you know, a couple of days as to what, you know, what, when the darkest day or the darkest point really is, if we're looking at the way that we measure it, in terms of hours of daylight and such. Okay, so, okay, this is a little bit about St. Lucy. It says, according to the traditional story, Lucy was born of rich and noble parents in about the year 283. Her father was of Roman origin, but died when she was five years old, leaving Lucy and her mother without a protective guardian. Although no sources for her life story exist other than in hagiographies, St. Lucy, whose name Lucia refers to light, is known to have been a Sicilian saint who suffered a sad death in Syracuse, Sicily, around A.D. 310. A devout Christian who had taken a vow of virginity, her mother betrothed her to a pagan. This is actually a really common story, so it's probably, um, probably the, the factuality of it is, uh, well, I'm sure the factuality of actually, actually is, is probably um, questionable at best. She was seeking help for her mother's long-term illness at the shrine of St. Agatha, When the saint appeared to her in a dream beside the shrine, St. Agatha told Lucy that the illness would be cured through faith and that Lucy and Lucy was able to convince her mother to cancel the wedding and donate the dowry to the poor. Enraged, her suitor then reported her to the governor for being a Christian. According to the legend, she was threatened to be taken to a brothel if she did not renounce her Christian beliefs, but they were unable to move her even with a thousand men and 50 oxen pulling. Yeah, this is highly unlikely. However, that's the story. And then supposedly, you know, they were going to um, set, you know, they, they lit a fire around her and set light to it, but it would, she would not stop speaking, insisting that her death would lessen the fear of it for other Christians and bring grief to non-believers. Soldier sticks a spear through her throat to stop this, but it to no effect. Another gouged out her eyes, but they were miraculously restored. So, yeah, she was only able to die when she was given uh, extreme unction or last rites. So it's, um, yeah, it, it interesting. Um thinking was extreme i guess well i guess extreme unction was a thing then i guess they had all those sacraments established uh but this is pre-council of nicaea so that is a little weird but and but of course yeah there's a lot of elements to this story that are clearly fictional like a lot of the martyrdom uh stories that are just meant to uh glorify the whole idea of martyrdom in these cases so okay so that's that's santa lucia okay and that is the saint who's feast is usually celebrated on December 13th. So let's let's now talk a little bit about Lucy, L-U-S-S-I. Uh, Lucinata, the Lucy Knight, was marked in Sweden on 13th of December. Then Lucy, a female being with evil traits like a female demon or witch, yeah, considered to be a sorceress, was said to ride through the air with her followers called Luciferda. This itself might be an echo of the myth of the wild hunt called Oscoria in Scandinavia found across northern, western, and central Europe. Between Lucy Knight and Yule, trolls and evil spirits, in some accounts also the spirits of the dead, were thought to be active outside. It was believed to be particularly dangerous to be out during Lucy Night. According to tradition, children who had done mischief had to take special care, since Lucy could come down to the chimney and take them away, and certain tasks of work in the preparation for Yule had to be finished, or else the Lucy would come to punish the household. The tradition of Lucy Vaca, to stay awake through the night to guard oneself and the household against evil, has found a modern form uh, through throwing parties until daybreak. So basically, partying all night is how you, how you deal with this. Uh, and there may be another meaning to that, too. Another company of spirits was said to come riding through the night around Yule itself, journeying through the air, over land, and water. 
and it says um, there's little evidence that the legend itself derives from the folklore of Northern Europe, but the similarities in the names Lucy and Lucia and the date of her festival, 13 Dece- December, I can get my, my dates right, suggests that the two separate traditions may have been brought together in the modern day celebrations in Scandinavia. And yes, no doubt they were. Okay, so we don't need to, to read any more about the actual about, about the actual Santa Lucia festivals or, or the way that they're celebrated. But, but I find, what I find very interesting here is the fact that we originally have this figure who is a, like a witch or sorceress figure who leads a, a pack like a, of these kind of undead, ghoulish, or otherworldly beings in a form of the wild hunt. And that this is the origin of Santa Lucia Day. It's also interesting that this is the solstice day. Uh, so we can immediately some, see some similarities here to Samhain. Uh, which is considered to be really in the, certainly at least among the Celts, that was the beginning of winter. And similarly, you have this this liminal period in which the gates to the underworld open. And yes, people need to stay in their houses. They need to hang certain protections outside. Uh, otherwise, uh, the dead could come into their house and, and uh, you might also be carried off and end up being dead. <laughs> so it's there's definitely this strong connection to this like this opening of the gates between the worlds on these particular nights. Um, I'm going to read just a couple of other accounts of uh, Lucinat. I have a couple different ones. This one's from the Norwegian American. They're, okay, they're talking about Santa Lucia Day, and they're saying there's a far older winter tradition that once cast fear into the hearts of Norwegian peasants and rural folk. It resol- revolved around another Lucy. This one not a saint, more like a witch, or a reverse version of the sun goddess that was revered in ancient Rome at this time of year. She shares the December 13 date for good reason. Under the old calendar, that was the date of the winter solstice. Thus, it was known in Norway as Lucy Long Night, Lucy Long, uh, Long Knot, longest night of the year. For 500 years, December 13 marked the solstice. This was the date when the sun turned its course, bringing on longer days. When a new calendar became official in 1700, the solstice was moved to its present day of December 21st, but Lucy Night remained the same. Yule, the pre-Christian winter celebration, was the most important holiday in Scandinavia and Northern Europe, and many of the old traditions, some from the Viking Age, others from ancient Rome, persisted, especially in the rural areas. All work had to be done by December 13, especially threshing, slaughtering, cleaning, and the spinning of yarn. If people hadn't finished all their work, they feared Lucy would smash up their chimney. Such terrifying legends fed the imagination of country folk for centuries, and Lucy had company, a whole array of terrifying creatures, trolls and undead spirits, kidnapping anyone foolish enough to venture outside. Known as uh, the Oscore, the Wild Hunt, this dreaded winter parade was on the lookout for earthly victims. So yeah, she talks about this um, Kathleen Stalker's book. She says, These folk legends told of individuals being snatched up, carried away, and then turned loose, dazed and manhandled, in some far-off place. Other victims disappeared forever. Especially features such as Lucy Lang... Lang sorry. Lucy Langnot, when most Norwegians would be afraid to leave their homes. Someone had to stay awake all night to protect the farm on this, the darkest night of the year. People hung axes, knives, or scissors over the doors of their homes and painted crosses everywhere. Children were especially terrified of Lucy, for it was said that if they misbehaved, she would come and snatch them away. On the eve of December 13, children would write the word Lucy on doors, fences, and walls. Lucy fires used to be burned in many parts of northern Europe at that time to celebrate the changing of the sun's course. As for Santa Lucia, one of a scant handful of saints honored in Protestant Scandinavian countries, her festival of light seems more appealing to many than the nightmare of the wild hunt. Okay, so yes, so that's that one. And let's see. So what do we have here? Okay, so Lucinata or Lucinat. Uh, Okay, so this is another, this is from witchlike.wordpress.com. And says, if you happen to see Lucy and her elven group, beware. Any human who encounters the wild hunt might be abducted to the underworld. It is also believed that people's spirits can be pulled away during their sleep to join the cavalcade, which also would explain why people need to stay awake, or that somebody does anyway. During the long nights between Lucinata and Yule, trolls, daemons, and the spirits of the dead 
are thought to be swirling about outside, enjoying the darkness. They are particularly active on Lucy night. Naughty children are advised to hide away. According to some traditions, Lucy herself can come down through the chimney and abduct children who have been bad. And this person comments, seems to me Lucy may be in cahoots with Krampus and old St. Nick. Yeah, there's clearly a similarity there. But adults should beware too. Lucy is particularly sensitive to all those dull and time-consuming chores that must be done before Yule. You know, gathering wood for the fire, stocking the larder, salting the meat, and making jam. If you, lazy human, have not completed your winter tasks, you just may be abducted along with your nasty children. Some people do not want to take that chance even in their dreams. In a tradition called Lucy Vaca, folks would stay awake all night through the long Lucy night in order to guard themselves and their household against abductions. However, in the 21st century, Lucy Vaca has apparently taken on a different form. It's called partying till the break of dawn. If you don't make it through the entire night, it still might be fun to stay up extra late. Okay, so they were talking about that. So, okay, so there's there's that in, um, information about it. And then finally, I'm going to look at one from bladehonerwordpress.com. We talk, they talk about uh, Lucy Long Night. And it said... Okay, so let's just find the... Um, okay, this is the night when the month of Yule began, and it was also the most dangerous night of the year. A female spirit, a vet, ruled this night going by the name of Lucy, which means light. She was the mother and or queen of the vetir spirits and other huldrefolk, otherworldly beings, as such akin to huldra, gnomes, trolls, and some, at some time in history, even to the gods. She has a relationship to the riders from Asgard. Uh, which is, uh, the, and also to another tradition that is, you see in Iceland, known as that of the, the Yule Riders. Oh, well, actually, I think that's the Yule Lads. Uh, but there's another, this other idea of, of the Yule Riders, the um, uh, Yularia, I think is how you say that. People had to stay inside on this night, eating and celebrating to placate and avert the anger of Lucy's uh, retinue and keeping the lights on. It was also very important to take care of the animals. Lucy, pale-faced and terrible, would come to check that everything was ready for Yule, the spinning and the baking primarily. If this work was not satisfactory, she could become so angry that she came down the chimney and into the house, and sometimes she would break down the whole chimney. Or she could press her terrifying face to the window to check how it looked, and if things were not ready for Yule, she would, according to Norwegian sources, cry out piercingly, I'm going to do the English translation of this, not brewed, not baked, no great fire do they have. This was also the night of the year in which animals would talk to each other and let pass their verdicts on how humans treated them. And woe to the people who did not treat their animals well. Vengeance would come from Lucy and her retinue of dark spirits. So the barn and the stable had to be clean and comfy for the beasts, and they would be bribed with particularly good food this night in the hopes that they would give a favorable, favorable report to Lucy. The animals would discuss all the year's events and pass on all the gossip they had witnessed. Uh, this was thought to be the longest night of the year, hence the term long knot, long night. And apart from brewing the beer and the ale and the mead and feeding the animals well and keeping the houses clean, and having finished with all the years spinning, the most important cakes had to be made, the Lucy cats. And they are at, this person questions whether this is a link between Lucy and the goddess Freya. And the Lucy cats, or Lucy Cather, are baked with saffron. So these are the saffron cakes. And it's, wow, wow it's just really weird. I'm looking at a picture of them right now. And they're like those S-shaped kind of things. My grandmother used to actually buy things like this. And actually, I just made a whole bunch of cookies that are not um, Lucy Cather, but they're very, very similar in terms of how they look, which is kind of interesting. So you can use saffron or turmeric, the, the imported spice that gives a yellow color, symbolizing gold, sun, and light, and associated with both Freya and Lucy. They must be formed like two spirals, and a raisin or other dry fruit would serve to give the impression of cat's eyes, sight in the dark. These are ancient symbols of the sun reaching back to the Nordic Bronze Age. It was important to have these cakes ready for Lucy, although they were eaten in her honor by all the people of the farm, including the lowest. Okay, so then she, they talk a bit about Santa Lucia Day, which we've already discussed. So, all right. So there's uh, quite a bit of information there, but we see all the similarities there. There's a few variations in these different articles about what is done or what is expected. And I want to note some similarities to other figures that I've noticed just through reading this. Now, there's other figures I've covered in the past in this podcast, among them uh, Frau Perkta and Grilla, okay? But Frau Perkta, or Frau Halle in particular, were actually quite similar in function. They are both um, these 
these hags or these older women associated with winter. Uh, certainly Frau Perkta was one that expected uh, that the flax had to be spun, that, when, that any, any flax that was needed spinning had to be spun by Twelfth Night, which is the 6th of January, uh, also known as the Epiphany. And just as a tidbit, I believe this is also a feast day of Persephone in the ancient times. But uh, but if then if the flax wasn't spun, then she might actually destroy the flax in some fashion. So we so we see this similarity to Lucy coming around to make sure that the winter preparations are made. Um, you also think about the stories of the Yola uh, Kotorin, the Yule cat. And, and the Yule lads that you see in Icelandic folklore. Certainly with the Yola Kutarin, uh, this was a giant cat. Uh, I'd, I'd be in trouble in this country. I'd see the giant cat, and I'd just want to let it in. But uh, this giant cat, which was actually very scary and which you did not want to let in, uh, you were at risk if children did not have new clothes or if the people did not have new clothes in the house. Then the Yola Kutarin could, uh, could attack you. Now, I'm also, I found, as I was looking at this, I found myself thinking about Baba Yaga as well. Now, Baba Yaga is not part of these winter narratives. However, one of the, when you look at the stories of Baba Yaga, when the, 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 particularly the story that you have of the, of the girl who loses her father, so, the, so there's the good girl, and then there's the, and she has the wicked stepmother, and then with the wicked stepmother, and then there's then the, the stepmother's natural daughter, uh, and apparently the stepmother's related to Baba Yaga, but because she, she hates the stepdaughter now that the father is dead and the father's not there to protect her, sends her into the woods to uh, get get something from Baba Yaga. I think that she was also trying to get something like abs- you know absurd, like strawberries in February or something like that. But in any case, um, there was something that she was sent to. She was sent to Baba Yaga for, for some purpose, and I've I've seen slight variations on this, but... The, the real gist of this is that the girl goes and then Baba Yaga sets her to work doing all of these different tasks. And the, the girl who is the, the stepdaughter completes all these tasks faithfully and does everything that Baba Yaga asks. And thus, in the end, Baba Yaga actually not only rewards her with what she came for, but also she has the thing that she can produce a gold coin. Like every time she opens her mouth, she can produce a gold coin. So she is blessed for having... Uh, dutifully completed all the work that she needs to do. So when the stepmother saw this, she sends the natural daughter to see if she can get more gold. But the natural daughter is lazy and refuses to work and is insolent and doesn't want to do anything. So Baba Yaga uh, punishes her instead. And when she goes home, every time she opens her mouth, it produces a frog. <laughs> so uh, there's, there's nonetheless, there's this whole idea about making preparations about the importance of domestic work, about getting the, the work done in the house. And certainly at Yule time, which the solstice is, particularly in Scandinavian countries, where it's absolutely the darkest night of the year. Um, I think I was reading one of these accounts that they said daylight is literally just a blue flicker on the horizon on that day. Like it's, it's a day of complete darkness. And of course, as we know with solstice, just because it is represents the returning of the light, because the Earth is tilting on its axis again in, in such a way that uh, the sun will be higher in the sky. and, and it, But certainly in those countries, as the Earth is tilted away from the sun, and, it's, and you know, in the southern hemisphere is now the ones that are getting summer and, and having all the sunlight, this is a time of just absolute complete darkness. And those of us who don't live in those countries, that's really, really hard to envision. Because we we don't you know that 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 complete darkness is something that is it's just, and and I, I imagine if you are living in a in a culture where cultures where you are reliant on crops and on agriculture and and your livestock and and the fields that this especially is something that is that that can be very very concerning that there's there will be a fear connected to the coming of solstice or coming of these dark days. Because, you know, you don't have the warmth of the sun. You don't have the light. And, of course, during this period, it's wintertime. Things don't grow. So this is really a very... It, it's almost like living in the underworld, so to speak. You're, you're in this, this place of, of darkness, and you're waiting for this return of sunlight. 
and you know and 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 also of of being able to grow and have things so yeah there's a tremendous amount of preparation that's made and all of these kinds of christmasy folklore figures or these yule yulish <laughs> yulish is that is that a word uh all the figures from this this kind of december period of time that are connected to this in these countries certainly represent the fact that there is a great danger in not being prepared for the winter because you can't just say, well, oh, well, you know, more more of it will grow right now. I mean, yeah, eventually. But you are going to have, you know, two or three months perhaps where, you know, you have to have had enough stored. You have to have enough, uh, as they said, you know, the beer has to be prepared. You have to have your, your food, you know, prepared and cured and salted if it was meat. Um you know, any any grains that you're storing have to be prepared and everything has to be ready so that you don't have to, you don't have to rely on crops right now. You have everything stored away. And of course, that you have a proper fire in the hearth. That's why you have this idea of the Yule log that burns for a very long time. Everything has to be prepared. You know, the light is returning, but as the light is returning, you still need, to, there's still a period of time in which you need to be prepared. So, getting the light is you know it's not it's not enough the light is returning which is good but that's not sufficient because the light is still not at its full strength yet it's still very much in its infancy now i would like to talk a little bit about the uh, the wild hunt okay so i'm going to again read just a quick thing about the wild hunt for those who don't know what it is the wild hunt is a folklore motif occurring across various northern european cultures uh, wild hunts typically involve a chase led by a mythological figure escorted by a ghostly or supernatural group of hunters engaged in pursuit. The leader of the hunt is often a named figure associated with Odin or Wotan in Germanic legends, but may variously be a historical or legendar- legendary figure, like Theodoric the Great, the Danish king uh, Valdemar Atterdag, the dragon slayer uh, uh, Sigurd, the Welsh psychopomp uh, Gwynapnud, biblical figures such as Herod, Cain, Gabriel, or the devil, or an unidentified lost soul or spirit, either male or female. The hunters are generally the souls of the dead or ghostly dogs, sometimes fairies, valkyries, or elves. Seeing the wild hunt was thought to forebode some catastrophe such as war or plague, or at best the death of the one who witnessed it. People encountering the hunt might also be abducted to the underworld or the fairy kingdom. In some instances, it was also believed that people's spirits could be pulled away during their sleep to join the Calvacade. Now, they talk about this, um, the whole motif being developed by Jacob Grimm. And what I want to do is, yeah, let's look at the historiography here of this a little bit. It says, the concept of the wild hunt was documented by the folklorist Jacob Grimm, who published it in his 1835 book, uh, Deutsche Mythology. Mythology. Um, it was in this work that he popularized the term uh, wild hunt for the phenomenon. Grimm's methodological approach was rooted in the idea, common in 19th century Europe, that modern folklore represented a fossilized survival of the beliefs of the distant past. In developing the idea of the wild hunt, he mixed together recent folkloric sources with textual evidence dating to the medieval and early modern periods. Um, but again, this, this approach is not, not generally considered particularly useful, or, or at least it's been criticized, certainly in modern times. Okay, Grimm interpreted the wild hunt phenomenon as having pre-Christian origins, arguing that the male figure who had appeared in it was a survival of folk beliefs about the god Woden, or Wotan, who had lost his sociable character, his near-familiar features, and assumed the aspect of a dark and dreadful power, a specter and a devil. Grimm believed that this male figure was sometimes replaced by a female counterpart, whom we refer to as Holda and Berkta, very similar to Frau Halle and Frau Berkta, Berkta, right? In his words, not only Wutan and the other gods, but heathen goddesses too, may head the furious host. The wild hunter passes to the, into the woodwife, Woden into Frau Gaude. He added his opinion that this female figure was Woden's wife. Discussing uh, martial elements of the wild hunt, Grimm commented that it marches as an army, it portends the outbreak of war. Well, maybe. He added that a number of figures had been recorded as leading the hunt, such as Wotan, Huckleberry, Berholt, bestriding their white war horse, armed and spurred, appear, appear still as supreme directors of the war for which they, so to speak, give license to mankind. Grimm believed that in pre-Christian Europe, the hunt led by a god or goddess 
and a goddess, actually, either visited the land at some unholy tide, bringing welfare and blessing, accepting gifts and offerings of the people, or they alternately float unseen through the air, perceptible in cloudy shapes, in the roar and howl of the winds, carrying on war, hunting, or the game of nine pins, the chief employments of ancient heroes, an array which, less tied down to a definite time, explains the more natural phenomenon. Again, this is his idea that these mythical things explain, explain natural phenomenon, which they may or may not. He believed that under the influence of Christianization, the story was converted from being that of a solemn march of the gods to being a pack of horrid specters dashed with dark and devilish ingredients. So, yeah, so there's this idea of this, this idea of either a hunt or, or a war-like band. And I'm going to look down into how this wild hunt manifested in Scandinavia. There's, there's different ones in Germany and in England and, and different places. This is a, this is a motif. It, it, it's common enough to be a numbered folklore motif, okay, to talk about the wild hunt. Okay, in Scandinavia, the leader of the hunt was Odin, and the event was referred to as o Odin's hunt. Um, I'm not going to try to say the word. And um, Oskorea, uh, Odin's hunt was heard but rarely seen, and a typical trait is that one of Odin's dogs was barking louder and a second one fainter. Besides one or two shots, these barks were the only sounds that were clearly identified. When Odin's hunt was heard, it meant changing weather in many regions, but it could also mean war and unrest. According to some reports, the forest turned silent and only a whining sound and dogs, dog barks could be heard. In western Sweden, and sometimes in the east as well, it has been said that Odin was a nobleman or even a king who had hunted on Sundays, and therefore was doomed to hunt down and kill supernatural beings until the end of time. According to certain accounts, Odin does not ride, but travels in a wheeled vehicle, specifically a one-wheeled cart. Now, that I found interesting, just because we also see Samhain stories of the Morrigan coming out of her cave in Ireland, with her ghastly horde as well, riding on a one-legged chestnut horse. I always find this idea of a one-legged vehicle at this time of year, and um, I think this has a lot to do with the liminality of the time, because during a liminal period, things that should not be, um, that, 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 don't, that, that shouldn't be according to the natural laws of how things are, uh, at least as we experience them in this world, occur when those boundaries are broken. It's almost the idea that the laws of nature are broken because how do you how do you ride on something that that is meant to have four and only has one? I mean there are ways that it could happen, but but the idea that one could go out and do that, it, it it's a there there's a there's a supernatural quality to that. And so it so to me that that conveys the the liminality there. The fact that you are you are being conveyed in a vehicle that only has one leg or one wheel or one one something, um, it, it's that that paradox of that in between world where you know it, it, you really don't have what would can be considered enough you know legs or wheels or whatever to move, and yet there's this movement. So um, okay, in parts of uh, I don't know if you say that Smelland 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 I can't there's a, there's a dot over the A, so I'm not sure I'm saying that right. It appears that people believe that Odin hunted with large birds when the dogs got tired. When it was needed, he could transform a bevy of sparrows into an armed host. That's interesting, too, because if you see the behavior of birds at the beginning of winter, any birds that are still in the region, those that haven't flown uh, away to warmer climates, uh, they do have this kind of weird, uh, bouncy kind of chattering energy that you associate, whether it be sparrows or in this area, we have juncos and uh, catbirds and different different ones that, that, that can engage in this kind of behavior. If houses were built on former roads, they could be burnt down because Odin did not if because Odin did not change his plans if he had formerly traveled on a road there. Not even charcoal kilns could be built on disused roads because if Odin was hunting, the kiln would be ablaze. Okay, so one tradition maintains that Odin did not travel further up than an ox wears his yoke. So if Odin was hunting, it was safest to throw oneself onto the ground in order to avoid being hit. Uh, this is a pourquoi story that evolved as an explanation for the popular belief that persons lying at ground level are safer from lightning strikes than persons who are standing. In uh, Algult, okay, it was safest to carry a piece of bread and a piece of steel when going to church and back during Yule. 
The reason was that if one met the rider with the broad-rimmed hat, one should throw the piece of steel in front of oneself, but if one met his dogs first, one should throw the pieces of bread instead. And in fact, there, well, I read something else about one of the San Santa Lucia festivals, where if one of the trolls or fairies was following, you know, one of the girls in the procession, that she should have a, take one of the pieces of bread and throw it behind her for them to take. So this this is also this actually reminds me of uh, Kerberos at the gate. You know, that the way that you got past the three headed dog that was, you know, had, was at the gate of the underworld, you. You, you always often had a piece of bread or you had a something like that sopped in wine because not only then would the dog take the bread but then with the wine it would fall asleep so yeah so this is this is rather rather interesting and and yeah so there's this idea of making offerings to these um, these winter deities who come up out of the underworld at this time and I think with something like the Lucy story, uh, not only do we have here, we've got a dual element here, because one, we've got this idea of preparedness for winter and the destruction that can come if you're not prepared for winter. Yeah, you have, if, you don't, if you don't have everything set by now, it, it's not, this is not a time of year when you can go outside and work. Yeah, you need to be, for winter, you need to really be staying in, hibernating, have all of your food and all of your preparation in the house. And then there's also the matter of the treatment of the animals. So it's really funny that they bribe the animals to, you know, hey, don't don't tell on us, or we'll give you something extra so that you say nice things about us. And and the way in which one could be punished for their treatment of animals. So this really ties everything back to natural forces, and the way in which uh, the natural forces at this time of year, which can be very destructive, if you are not following the rules or you are not playing along the same way, you can be carried you can be carried off if you're not following everything according to the the customs, the the taboos, the rituals of that particular time period. Because it's a liminal time period and certainly among rural folk, liminal time periods are very, very dangerous. They are the times when these kinds of beings are on the prowl and when they roam about. So you're on this precipice between between life and not only life and death, but this world and another world. And so this this is a this is a tradition that you see. I, I can see connections of this throughout these other either Samhain or or Yule kind of rituals throughout different parts of Europe. So yeah, so I think um, we so we we can see that, and then we we also have this idea of so we have this idea of this precipice between life and death, and and, our, and the preparedness for that, but also the way in which one appeases the catonic forces, because when you have the this darkness and when nothing grows, then the forces of the underworld certainly appear to be ruling things. So you want to make sure that you have offerings or that you have things to give to those beings so that you yourself uh, aren't swept up with them or that you don't come along with them. You, you make this, it goes back to what I talk about with pact making. When you're dealing with forces that are greater than yourself, you need to make sure that you have uh, properly appeased them or properly made an, a respectful offering to them. It's about respecting nature. And of course, when we start, it's interesting that uh, Grimm's analysis of something like the Wild Hunt and saying that originally it was probably a, a procession of gods from this time of year that people, you know, threw their offerings out to this to this Wild Hunt. And of course, then there's everything that it potentially could presage, seeing this rather chaotic band from the underworld or from the Catonic realm passing through passing through your village or passing through the forest. Uh, that's nearby. Um, there's certainly that respect that's shown, but the fact that this becomes a horde of demons and devils and ghouls and, and things that are considered to be very negative in nature shows the the flip in the way that the forces of nature are thought about, especially once you start getting into Christianization of these areas. So yeah, so uh, Lucy's day is re is replaced with the Santa Lucia day. There's similarly this idea of, you know, bringing light in darkness, but the, the, the inflection is different there. It's not about preparedness for winter. It's about like some saint coming and, and bringing the light or bringing these baked goods or bringing something here, you know, it, it, and trying to give it a parallel with a Christian myth. 
uh, or Christian martyrdom myth. And it, so it's it, so we can really observe here what I have often said about the way in which Earth becomes devalued when you start getting into religions that have to do with salvation. This one's actually a really good illustration because you have Lucy, a figure of darkness that one has to appease by being adequately prepared and potentially by having something to offer either her or someone in her horde to having it be about um, this saintly martyr figure appearing, you know, bringing, you know, baked goods, blessings, you know, whatever. Uh, so there's this notion of being saved by the saint as opposed to uh, making the offering to the dark hordes so that you, you know, who are there to make sure not only that you are prepared, but that you have been adequately respectful. That respect to the land is important because that is your livelihood. And you need to show the respect to the spirits and those things that are the, the consciousness of the land in order to yield uh, the fruits and the results that, you know, in, in the following year during spring, summer, and, and then, of course, at the harvest at the fall or autumn time. So uh, interesting story here, another little in, uh, winter myth that we have. Uh, so I hope uh, you enjoyed that story. We're going to have one more for 2023. And this one is, yeah, this is interesting because I, I certainly was very well aware of Santa Lucia Day, but I was not aware of the mythology of Lucy un, until recently. And yeah, it, 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 it is interesting to see how the, myth, how the <clears throat> folklore surrounding winter and the coming of winter is celebrated through throughout these the, these northern regions, northern and central Europe, really. Before I lose my voice, which I feel like I'm about to do, I want to say thank you very much again for listening this week. Um, if you would like to become a patron of uh, the Catonia podcast, please check out patreon.com slash Catonia. I always thank my patrons at the beginning of the episode, so I will give a shout out to them again. Uh, if you want to see all of my work, it is featured on the website katonia.net. And if you want to follow me on social media, it is Katonia Podcast. Uh, one word on, okay, I'll get this right, one word on X and Instagram. Uh, mainly Instagram. I don't spend a whole lot of time on X. And two words on Facebook. And then, of course, it's there's just Katonia on YouTube if you're watching it there. Though, I did see that YouTube now puts it up as Katonia Podcast as well as one word. So... Uh, so anyway, thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.